secret. Um, that's interesting too, because it's it's a huge jump from what we have. Uh, clearly, our pilots didn't know what they were seeing. They had no idea what they were what they were observing. They didn't know if it was extraterrestrial. They didn't know if it was terrestrial. All they knew was that what they were observing blew their minds. That they, they these are trained observers. They know what the flight characteristics of an earthly aircraft are, or technology they're aware of. But this this thing was going <laughs> going crazy in front of their eyes. So they weren't able to identify it. So um, fascinating stuff. <laughs> it is. Roswell, do you think Roswell ever happened? Do you think it was a weather balloon? No. No, that's 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 one of the few cases that I think uh, my professional position has always been that the data strongly suggests the extraterrestrial. We just can't prove it because we don't have a, we don't have a piece of the craft. We don't have a body to examine. But no other explanation fits the data. Uh, it's not, it wasn't a weather balloon. It wasn't... Nazi technology. It wasn't a Japanese firebomb. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't a hoax. Uh, it wasn't a mogul balloon. Um, so all these other explanations don't hold any water. The only explanation that fits the data, or the uh, sh- let me backtrack that, the explanation that fits the data the best is the extraterrestrial. So it's strongly suggestive of that. It leads you in that direction, but again, without a body or a piece of aircraft or a piece of material. Uh, we can't prove it, but my position is that Roswell was extraterrestrial. I think so because I saw original pictures of you know the, the, of the crash site minus the crash. Okay, whatever crashed there slid for a long distance and took out trees and and all that stuff. Very interesting, you know. When they when they first reported it, they they reported it as a flying saucer crashed, and then all of a sudden it, it was a balloon, weather balloon. I don't know any weather balloon would come in and take out trees and, and, and left the little bit of damage it left, it, that didn't make sense. And then when, you know, the military came out years later or a few years back and, and tried to even come up with another story, you know, which was is just as ludicrous as their their first story. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, they need yeah. better writers yeah. to come up with. <laughs> they should get a hold of somebody in in Hollywood that writes these scripts, you know, for like Star Trek, and yeah. write a, a better explanation how and what happened. Well, the military has always looked a little inept when they've attempted to explain uh, identified sightings. Um, but the idea that uh, the Roswell Army Airfield was the only atomically armed base on the planet at the time, so you would clearly have to have highly qualified individuals to man this base that had atomic weapons. The idea that these individuals would not be able to recognize a weather balloon is preposterous. Uh, the mogul balloon explanation doesn't hold any water either because the mogul, the, uh, the motivation, the, 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 uh, the purpose of mogul was secret, but the technology wasn't. The mogul balloons were made from very uh, mundane terrestrial materials. Nothing secret. So if you found a if you found a mogul balloon in a say a farm farm field or whatever, you'd be able to recognize it. A layperson would. I mean, Mac Brazel stated unequivocally that he had recovered other weather balloons before, and stated that this was not those things. This was something completely anomalous. This was not a weather balloon. Uh, so the idea that trained individuals couldn't recognize a weather balloon that's just ridiculous. But in the time frame we're talking about, in the late 40s, we just won World War II. So the public was much more trusting of the government. The public trusted the military. They were proud of the military. They were proud of our troops, rightfully so, because we just won the bloodiest war in the history of the planet. But having said that, that also meant that when the weather balloon explanation was thrown out there by uh, General Ramey, the public ate it up because they assumed it was the truth. And that was the end of the story. Um, until 1978. Uh, so it, it, it's still a fascinating case, even though it's 70, what, 74 some odd years after the fact, it's still a historically very important case to look at. It is. And, you know, and possible why maybe that craft did crash is they had experimental radar in the area, too, that, you know, uh, transmitted, uh, you know, radar on a low frequency compared to what they do nowadays. 
And maybe that, you know, there's been some scientists that maybe that caused the craft to crash. Uh, I, I don't agree with that assessment. No, because radar, radar in its very, in its very, in its very core is a radio beam. Right. And if, if this craft, if this craft was an extraterrestrial craft, it would have clearly gotten here from some distance away. Let's say, let's just throw out 10 light years. It would have come across much stronger radio sources on its way to earth than just our terrestrial radar. So if radar, if a radio beam had affected the craft, it wouldn't have made it here. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to cross the orbit of Jupiter uh, if if a radio beam had affected the craft or was had the capability of doing that. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that explanation holds water. But I'll not be wrong. I mean, I'm pretty pragmatic. I mean, we just don't know what caused the crash. It may have been something as simple as radar. I don't professionally. I don't think so. But again, we just don't know. So. Um, Again, frustrating. <laughs> but it, it is so. because, you know, I was reading about there was like two or three radars in that area. And this one scientist, and I can't think of his name, his he surmised maybe the craft was, you know, coming to investigate the area anyway, ran into the radar beams and it caused it to crash or malfunction. I mean, we don't know. I mean, it, it could have just been a malfunction of the UFO itself and it, it crashed. Maybe they were lousy pilots. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I usually I usually go with malfunction. I mean, when technology is created, regardless of how advanced it is, it's imperfect. Things can always go wrong. No matter how advanced we get as a species, as long as we don't blow each other up, our technology will always fail at some point. We'll always have uh, instrumentation that will fail, that will malfunction. So the idea that they came here from, say, several light years away to visit Earth and somehow the aircraft malfunctioned in our atmosphere, that's a distinct possibility. Because it's, it's illogical to assume that technology would be infallible. Um, so I, I tend to go in that direction. But I've heard things like the radar explanation, lightning strike, a collision with another craft, or what have you. I, th- I think it may be just as simple as a malfunction and they their technology failed when they crashed. That's a great possibility. And I wonder what happened to their body is again, there's all these reports of the, the fire chief, uh, the, you know, police, uh, you know, and people in the area that supposedly seen the bodies at the start. Uh, it's just, I don't know. It, 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 it's a story that will never have a, a real ending to it. Isn't it? Most likely not. No, unless we, at this point, unless we had, uh, definitive documentation that would hold up under scrutiny, or in the scenario of disclosure, we were actually able to, as a public, examine the evidence left behind by the Roswell incident. Uh, we won't be able to prove it. We won't be able to to come to a, a conclusion for it. So, so the story will always be out there. Um, as far as the bodies, I mean, at the time, the late forties, uh, the most logical place for them to send any kind of recovered technology and evidence, which would include organic material, would have been right field in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so if there were bodies recovered, they most likely would have been sent there first. If if we assume they were recovered and they were sent to right field, would they still be there now? Uh, I have no idea. But I think it's logical to assume their initial destination would have been right field, uh, now better known as Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, yeah. I think that's where they were. Yeah. Now, there's been people who claimed that the bodies existed, but they, well, decomposed really fast. So I don't know. I mean, I guess everybody yeah. has their own, you know, views on this. I, I wish, you know, we actually knew, you know, Jackie Gleason, Nixon story, you know, where Nixon supposedly took Jackie Gleason to see these alien bodies. And Jackie Gleason, to the day he died, you know, was going around telling these stories that, you know, Nixon took him to to show him uh, alien bodies and that he saw these alien bodies. Do you buy that or do you think Jackie Gleason was just full of it? I don't know what to think about it. (laughs) I don't know. I'm going to tell you. I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, uh, Gleason swore up and down that that story was true. He was fascinated by the paranormal. He had a massive a collection of UFO and paranormal books. Um, it's well established he knew Richard Dixon. 
they weren't just uh, associates. They they were friends. They they spent a lot of time together. So, um, did that translate into that story being reality? Uh, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, it's a fascinating story, um, because fr- from from a skeptical standpoint, I need to look at it saying, okay, uh, would the president have access to that to that evidence, and would the president be able to take a civilian? To examine the evidence, I, I don't know. Uh, we just don't know. And since the, both the individuals are deceased, and there's no documentation to prove it either way, again, that's going to be another story in ufology that's going to have a life of its own. It's going to be. It's going to live forever, and we may not be able to come in to to determine at all whether it's valid or not. So, but it's very. It's a fascinating. Fascinating story. It, it is. And Gleason, it, by the way, Gleason was very knowledgeable about UFOs, by the way. Oh, yeah. Extremely knowledgeable. He was. And yeah. uh, of all of the presidents, till Watergate, I think Nixon had more power uh, with the military uh, and the government than any other president before and since. I mean, really, he did have a lot more pull. So if any president could find out about ufos or have the capability of being informed about it i think nixon would have been the president i think after that that's when things really drastically changed yeah i've, I've spoken to several researchers that have kind of uh, gone they've they've got that same conclusion that nixon clearly had more pull and more access to uh potentially extraterrestrial evidence and data uh, than other presidents yeah i've heard that several times in the past, uh, that may be true. Uh, he, that may be the case, um, and I do agree. Certainly, after Nixon, uh, the presidents either have not been directly given access to UFO evidence or data, or they just didn't um, didn't really ask. They may have had so many other things on their plate. Because I mean, in today's world, there's so many things the president has to know on a day to day basis that UFOs is not at the top of the list. I mean. You have so many conflicts and issues. You have so many economic things to take into consideration. Um, the UFO issue may not be on the table at all. He, he's so busy with any all, all these other things. Plus, add to that, the political discourse here in our own country. So there's a lot going on, and President Trump may not be um, overly interested in adding more to his plate. No, uh, if, if he has. can't if he know. can't watch it on the news, I don't. You know, he's one president that actually refused to even be informed day to day. You know, from the CIA on reports of you know different things, he just didn't care to hear about it. I, I don't know. I'm not political. I voted for Trump. I kind of sometimes wonder why, but I just don't understand him. Hey, our time is up now. Is there a website or any way people can get a hold of you? Oh, you can reach me on Facebook. I have two, uh, well, actually three. I have a, my, obviously my personal account, but you can find me on my personal blog on Facebook entitled William Pullen UFO Historian or my interactive UFO group, which is where I do my objective work, uh, book reviews, uh, case summaries, poll questions. That's entitled You For Real, A Historical Review. Anybody can find me at those two locations and uh, join the group or support my blog, and that's where you can find me. Great. Well, hey, I want to thank you for coming on. Anytime you want to come on, hey, just email me. You're welcome on the show anytime. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I would love to be on the show again. Thank you, sir. Okay, you take care and have a great weekend. It's coming up. You too. Okay, night. See See you. Good night. So, James, you know, I I kind of like his fresh view of, you know. uh, Right, he's. Yeah, he's fact based. He's fact based, and that's and really you got to be open minded to the facts. You can't just be stubborn and say, "Well, it's this and this and that's it." Right. Hey, guess what? We're on break. We'll be back in two and a half minutes. You're listening to Night Dream Stock Radio after dark. Some significance of the both dimensional kind. You enter a realm of spirit, of sight and sound and mind. Your radio is a cosmic doorway and your psyche begins to spark. When you tune in to Gary and the Sun and Night Dreams After Dark.